Welcome back to the GCN Racing News Show. Mind-boggling watts, plenty of mud, and even a tantrum from the UCI presidents. Although the road season is off on its annual hiatus, it's been a drama-filled week in the world of racing. And we've got it all covered on this week's show. This week, we learned that Harry Lovrason was born to sprint, 2,338. That was his incredible peak wattage at this year's Track Champions League, which is, no surprise, the highest ever recorded at the event. We also learned that bikes have multiple uses. Lars van der Haar putting his dislocated shoulder back in place mid-race there. We also learned that in 2024, Yolo Kometa will become Team Pulte Kometa. Not particularly interesting in itself, but I am very much looking forward to seeing how reminiscent their jersey design will be of the original Team Pulte. I'll leave it to you to decide whether the red and yellow design is hot or not. And finally, we learned that Thibaut Nace has caused quite the stir at the UCI headquarters in Switzerland. The 21-year-old is one of, if not the breakout rider of the cyclocross season so far, but he decided to skip the World Cup event in Dendermonde on Sunday, even though he raced the Super Prestige event in Neil on Saturday. That decision made UCI president David Lepartiont very unhappy indeed. On the matter, Lepartiont spoke to Direct Velo, saying, the World Cup is not a ranking from which you can simply choose to your heart's content. He went on, if a cyclocross rider prefers a national competition while there is a World Cup, they will not participate in the next World Cup and therefore also not the Cyclocross World Championships. The UCI president then added, the World Cup is not a competition where you can choose what you want to ride. Everyone just has to participate. Very strong words indeed. I was particularly surprised to see Le Partien threatening to ban riders from future races and even the World Championships. Now, important to note here, the first World Cup event of the year took place in Waterloo, the United States, which is the home of NACE's team, Balawa's Trek Lions. Think back a few weeks to that event. NACE claimed a famous win, his first at World Cup level at his team's home race. He held his bike aloft as he crossed the finish line, a day that he, nor dare I say his team, will ever forget. Le Passion, however, was more lenient about riders potentially missing the inaugural World Cup event of the season. He said, as far as the United States is concerned, I can understand that. That move for just one race is hard. We must therefore create a combination with Canada as well. He also spoke about creating a second race in Northern Italy to combine with the Val de Soleil World Cup events. Now, I have numerous points to make here. Firstly, the World Cup calendar has expanded substantially in recent years. There are 14 events this year. Just five years ago, there were nine World Cup events, and five years before that, in 2013-2014, there were just seven races. So the World Cup schedule has doubled in terms of volume in the space of a decade. Is it therefore really fair to expect riders to race the full schedule as it may have been in the past? And there's a second issue. What to do with the multi-discipline superstars? The ability of Matthew Van Der Poel, Wout van Aert and Tom Pickcock over various disciplines is all part of their magnetism. But after racing a full road season, there's simply no way they can ride every CX World Cup event. And they don't. Last year, they all missed the first five World Cup races and Van Der Poel and Van Aert skipped the first six and seven respectively. Circling back now to Thibaut Nace, he accumulated 57 race days on the road this year with Trek Sega Frodo. He was on the start line for the Super 8 Classic on 16th September and began his first CX race of the year at the B-Mine Cross on 8th October, just 22 days between those races. In my view, Nace should surely be treated the same way as Van Aert, Van Der Poel, etc. He has had a full road season, so surely can't be expected to complete a full CX season from the very off. Another factor, Sunday 12th November was actually Thibaut Nace's birthday, so perhaps he just had a party to attend. I know I wasn't racing CX covered in mud on my 21st birthday. So what to make of all of this? Is David Lepartiant right? Should all CX riders do all they can to race every World Cup event? And should they suffer punishments such as race bans if they don't? Alternatively, are his comments completely out of order? I think you can tell which side of the fence I'm sitting on, but I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. We'll continue to cover the story as it unfolds over the coming weeks. 
Anyway, Nice was on the start line in Neil for round three of the Super Prestige, where he struggled to 27th place in heavy conditions. At the head of the men's race, Elie Isabit and Joris Neuvenhaus went toe-to-toe -to -toe throughout. The pair had ridden flawlessly in the mud-strewn race, but a problem for Neuvenhaus coming out of the pits on the final lap saw a small gap open up, and that was all Isabit needed to take victory. Ride of the day, however, was Felipe Orts in third, riding pretty much every section of the course when others were off and running. It was a real breakthrough moment for the Spaniard, the first super prestige podium of his career. Lorena Vibes turned up for a dabble in the mud in the women's race. She might have regretted it after just a few minutes though. Her SD Works teammate, Marie Schreiber, got off to a flyer, but she was eventually overtaken by Kaylin Alvarado, who continued her fantastic form to take home the win. While Schreiber faded, Anique van Alphen rocketed through the field to finish seconds, capitalizing on a last lap slip from teammates Anne-Marie Verst, who rounded out the podium. Sunday's World Cup in Dendermonde heralded Lucinda Brand's return to racing after a lengthy spell out due to injury following a crash at the CMAC Ladies Tour. She couldn't have asked for a better start, but once again, Kaylin Alvarado took control in heavy conditions, winning in the end by 37 seconds ahead of Brand. In third, a career first for Zoe Bapstead. She bagged an elite World Cup podium spot aged just 19, all done while feeling under the weather. Yeah, I'm really happy with it, considering uh, after recon I didn't know whether I was going to start. I mean, you can probably hear it in my voice, I'm not, not feeling 100%, so okay. third place today, elite podium, I've got to be over the moon with that one. With Femme Van Empel taking a short break after the first part of her season, be careful Femme, Alvarado now leads the World Cup standings by 15 points, with Backstead moving up to third. With the conditions ever changing in the men's race, the key to victory seems to be a fine balancing act on which sections to ride and which ones to run. Toon van den Bosch and Lauren Swake took advantage in this section near the pit lane, and latching onto the coattails of the Crayland duo was Pim Ronha, who launched his own attack in the deep mud on lap four. The young Dutchman did a great job to maintain that initial gap, and he rode away for his maiden elite victory at a World Cup holding off a fast-finishing Lars van der Haar, who pipped Lauren Swake to third place. Van der Haar now leads the World Cup overall by nine points ahead of Ellie Isabit. 40 points for Ron Haar puts him into third place overall. Away from the mud now and into the velodrome, the UCI Track Champions League concluded with rounds four and five in London. All four of the leaders going into round four managed to hang on to be crowned champions after the grand finale. Let's start with the endurance though. The crowds of the Olympic velodrome were behind the home riders and it showed in the results. Four of the six races across the two rounds were won by British riders. Katie Archbold came away with the women's overall endurance title. She took yet another maximum 20 points in the round four elimination race before riding a somewhat more conservative round five to secure her second TCL overall victory. Danny Khan and Nair Evans won the two scratch races, while the final elimination race was won by Ireland's Lara Gillespie, who has been steadily improving throughout the series and is certainly one to watch in the future on the track and the road. An intriguing three-way battle in the men's endurance race saw Dylan Bibich take the overall title, but it was far from straightforward. The Canadian was dumped out in a lowly 13th place in the round four elimination race. And with his nearest rivals, Will Tidball and Jules Hesters going on to take 1-2 in that race, it set up a tantalizing final round. Bibich was determined not to give up his tentative lead though, gluing himself to the wheel of Tidball in the scratch race and allowing a non-threatening group up the road to hoover up the points. The benefactor of that was Mark Stewart, who lapped up the home support. After making the calculations, Bibic did just enough to take the required points in the elimination before bowing out as overall victor. And the six-day vibes took over as the Belgian duo of Tour Dens and Jules Hesters took a 1-2. The future certainly looks bright for Bibic, and he already has a rainbow jersey at elite level and now the youngest ever TCL winner on his Palmarès, all at just 20 years of age. The women's sprint category continued to be a ding-dong battle heading into round four, where Aless Andrews lost out in the semi-final of the sprints. She could only watch on as her closest rival, Alessa Catriona Propster, took the 20 points. The German couldn't drive the advantage home in the Kieran, however, only managing sixth in the final, where Martha Bayona took the win and Andrews was second. 
it still meant that only seven points separated the two going into the finale. But Andrew shut down any hopes of a last gasp upset, winning both the sprint and the Kieran to secure the jersey in style in her first participation at the Track Champions League. Special mention to Martha Bayona, who finished third in the overall rankings despite skipping the Berlin round due to a clash with the Pan American Games. Finally, the men's sprint, and Harry Lovrayson came into the final two rounds with a healthy lead, but uncharacteristically left the velodrome after round four without a win. Another epic sprint final with Matt Richardson saw the Aussie come away with the 20 points, before Kevin Quintero reminded us why he's the world champion in the Kieran final. Saturday's finale saw Richardson once again beat Lavreyson in the sprint final, but the Flying Dutchman finished with a bang in the Kieran en route to his second overall win at the TCL. In terms of his dominance, he set a single season points record with 191 points, winning seven out of the 10 races. Absolutely remarkable consistency there. Okay, on to what's coming up on GCM Plus this week. And only two races for you now that the UCI Track Champions League has drawn to a conclusion. On Saturday, we have the next round of the Super Prestige from Mertz Blas, And then on Sunday, the UCI World Cup transitions to France, where Toi hosts round four. It's the only new venue for the 14 race series this year, so it'll be interesting to see what sort of course the riders will face. In other news, Rigoberto Uran has announced that he will retire from the sport following next year's Olympic Games. It's a race he's done well in before, achieving the silver medal in London 12 years ago. He'll definitely be missed as one of the most likeable riders in the bunch, as well as among fans. And what a career he's had. Runner-up as a Grand Tour on three occasions, including the 2017 Tour de France. He won a stage at all three Grand Tours as well, completing the sets at the Vuelta in 2022. Luke Plapp has joined Jaco Alula on a four-year contract, even though he had one year left to run on his agreement with the Ineos Grenadiers. Really interesting one here. Plapp will get plenty of leadership opportunities at Jaco, and we saw what he can do there in glimpses with Ineos. Second overall at the UAE Tour in February, and third overall at the Tour of Norway last year, beaten by Remco Evenepoel on both of those occasions. So that makes Plapp one to watch very closely in 2024. On the flip side, Ineos continue to lose out in the transfer market. Jani Moscon has signed with Sudal Quickstep. Presumably he came at a relatively cut price. The social media team dubbed him the team's Il Trattore, the Italian tractor, after their Belgian tractor Tim de Klerk left for Little Trek. Ben Hermans and Kenny Alessand have both moved to Cofidis from Israel Premier Tech and Little Trek respectively, while Jimmy Whelan will be back in the pro ranks next year with Q36.5. Team DSM Fermanick have signed Emils Leipins and Julius Vandenberg, surely a boost to new signing Fabio Jakobsen's lead-out train. 22-year-old Logan Curry has joined Lotto Destiny, while Anton Peltzer has extended his contract with Bora Hansgrohe. Elsewhere, Mark Renshaw has joined Astana Kazakhstan as a sports director after working as a sprint lead-out consultant this year. Carmen Small has been named head sports director at the newly formed EF Education Cannondale. She'll move over from Jumbo Visma. Continuing in the world of sports directors, the experienced Valerio Piva joins Jaco Alula, having made the move from Intermarche Circus Wanty. His former teams include BMC, Katusha and T-Mobile. And finally, the future of the Tour of Britain is in doubt. That's according to The Guardian. British Cycling terminated its agreement with Sweetspot, the race promoter, after a financial dispute. This essentially means a new promoter must be found swiftly if the race is to take place in 2024. So fingers crossed for good news on that matter sooner rather than later. Okay, that's all we have time for this week. Enjoy your racing and we'll see you again this time next week. Bye for now.